So, um, back to dark matter. We've been there yesterday already, and uh, not so much exascale, but I'll try to talk a little bit about uh, new algorithms that we've been working on to both uh, analyze and, and simulate uh, dark matter. Um, maybe just a very brief, quick review of the assumptions uh, that we put in. Uh, based on what we know about dark matter, we don't know much about dark matter. But what we know is it's probably a microscopic particle, which means that for all practical purposes, the continuum limit should apply. It is most likely, in order to be consistent with observations, a very cold fluid, which means it doesn't have an appreciable intrinsic velocity dispersion, or it's at least quite cold. Uh, it must have a negligible cross-section, otherwise we would have seen it. So, which means that at, at first order we can, we can probably uh, simulate it as purely gravitational interacting, and it's also the dominant dynamical component on cosmological scales for structure formation. It's about 27% uh, of, of the total energy budget of the universe today. Okay. Um, just putting these ingredients in, um, as we heard yesterday, uh, you, you basically get the initial perturbation spectrum then out from, from very simple physics. So all the, the, the density perturbation spectrum basically has, has only one scale, which is, which is given here, which is the scale of uh, the, the horizon at the radiation equality. On large scales, you, you have an increasing spectrum, and on small scales, uh, you have basically a, a scale-free spectrum for CDM. For CDM, there is no additional parameter. And uh, for other cosmological, uh, for other dark matter particle candidates, um, you, you have an additional parameter which, which introduces a mass scale of the dark matter particle, which then starts to affect the spectrum on, on cosmological scales, which leads to a truncation of the spectrum. That's all we're going to look at. So CDM basically is just a scale full spectrum in small scales, giving you something like that, very, very grainy spectrum. Uh, if for warm, the so-called warm dark matter particles, uh, the free streaming leads to uh, an effective genes mass at, 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 at early times, uh, which wipes out perturbations. And then um, the fluid, though, cools thereafter. Right? So wh why is it interesting to look at these kind of simulations? Uh, if, we, if we, any simulation has finite resolution on two, two scales, right? We have finite box size. Box not infinite, and we have a finite resolution element size, meaning we have a dynamic range on which we can capture the spectrum. If we do CDM, which is infinitely cold and has a never-ending perturbation spectrum, there is no hope we can have a, end up with a resolved simulation in principle, because as soon as we increase the dynamic range, we sample new perturbations. And so these these models are very interesting. Okay, so this is this is fairly well understood. We can fold in all this physics predict these linear perturbation spectra and, and make you know, predictions about CMP and so on. But what do we do when we go nonlinear? The nonlinear dynamics of a collisionless system with self-gravity is just uh, governed by the Blas of Poisson system, which uh, just basically has an advection term and which has an acceleration term depending on, on, on the force. And the only force is, is the self-gravity of the fluid. And, uh, to start, we'll just look at the favorite toy problem, of, uh, which is just a single mode perturbation. So this is the velocity, this is the spatial extent. So this thing, if it's cold enough and the, the temperature is zero, is in excess of its genes uh, scale and it will collapse. Uh, what will happen is the evection term will just move this uh, through itself. And because it's collisionless, uh, nothing will happen. It will just uh, cross to itself, and you, what, you, what you'll get is a, is a multi-streaming region in the center because here the velocity is three values. Right? Here's single values, and they position in space. Uh, here, here you have a, a caustic, and then it's three values. If you switch on self-gravity, this is slowed down, and what you get is a winding up of the spiral. Uh, and gravity is rather weak in one dimension, so not much more happens than this. Okay. So the situation after running this problem for a while is you get this typical spiral, and uh, the density between two neighboring points looks something like this. Right? So if you plot this function of x, you have caustic every time you have a vertical tangent here at the phase space distribution. So why? What's hard about this problem? So we have vanishing collision terms. So we're not in the kind of the hydro limit, meaning we 
cannot stop at the low order of movement expansion. Velocity field can be multi-valued, can be actually very multi-valued. Uh, we have singular features in the solution. And so probably the best we can do is to directly discretize the distribution function, which is, of course, what, what people have always been doing. So this is, again, the equation we have. And now, uh, the distribution function has a, has a very specific kind of structure because it's, it's infinitesimally cold. The, the velocity is really, truly single-valued single, single valued initially, and so it's, it's only occupying a three-dimensional surface in six-dimensional phase space. And since this microscopic temperature will never increase thereafter, uh, it'll just stay that way. It will always be this three-dimensional uh, manifold covering all of six-dimensional phase space. And so we can just parameterize it with a, a, a three-dimensional parameterization, three-dimensional mapping into a 6D phase space. Okay, then what's typically done is uh, you, you assume you go to the in-body limit, where then uh, you, instead of having this continuous structure here, you, you just place delta functions at random, not random, but uh, locations and, and uh, uh, velocities, and uh, you treat it in the, in the particle limit. But of course, if you do this, you get a, a collision term, uh, because at this order, it is just uh, nothing different than uh, gravitating bodies with singular forces, and so uh, you have to, to bound this collision term by force softening. And the other problem is, uh, since, since we're in the perfectly cold living, we have vanishing gene length, which means everything's unstable. All noise will potentially grow. Okay. Nevertheless, these caveats uh, will really point to its the next slide. This has been usually successful, of course, to predict, this is from, from the Bolshoi simulation, to predict the distribution of galaxies and structure in the universe. Uh, this is from Sloan, uh, and this is from Bolshoi. You can look at moments, and this matches extremely well. But arguably, this has been much, much less successful with non-vanilla as non-wind, non-cool dark matter candidates that have this additional feature of a truncation in the mission spectrum. Whenever people try to simulate this since the 80s, when our dark matter models were uh, considered still as, as possibilities, uh, people have seen that. that so, so the, what you see here is just a picture of a halo and, uh, and uh, some filaments in, in a, such a simulation that has suppressed small scale structure in the initial perturbation spectrum. And uh, this is taken from the one and one 2007 paper. What you see is you get these, uh, these beads on the string here. Uh, that line up, and uh, it doesn't matter how you distribute initially your particles, they always show up. Uh, and they only go away at the new level of increased uh, resolution. So you clearly have a sign of two body effects of either scattering or clumping fragmentation. You're not in the smoothly, in the smooth, in the fluid limit. Right here. Right. So, uh, the, the, the origin of this is, is of course, it's, it's just you have an anisotropic compression. You, have, you can collapse along three dimensions, so assume you have a particle lattice, you compress it along one dimension. Now you increase the density here, here, but not along this dimension. And now any kind of little perturbation here will lead to that it, this just forms clumps, right? And so what you should be doing is that you should force, soften the force on this scale, uh, but then you only get a linear improvement by, by eight, having eight times more particles. Meaning, once you once you go into into halos and so on, that's not what you want. You don't even want it here because, at the same time, on this dimension, you'd like to have more resolution because, in fact, you could also uh, you may afford it probably. Okay. So um, then we were thinking maybe you could think of a different discretization. So instead of uh, we had we had this sheet, and so instead of just when putting the particles down. We actually know much more. We know that neighboring particles on the sheet will always remain neighbors, and there will be never any holes that emerge, and there will be never any self-intersections of the distribution function. And so what you can do is, because that, that property is shared, you just put down a, uh, so in, in, in 2 plus 2D, you would just put down a triangulation. In 3 plus 3D phase space, you just put down a, a tessellation into, into tetrahedra. Uh, so every point here is, is just uh, the connection between four points uh, that make up a tetrahedron are just neighboring points on the distribution function that will always remain neighboring points 
on the distribution function. So what this looks like is, so I just put down my points in 2D space, I bring out the two-dimensional velocity, I triangulate it, I impose my density perturbations, so it looks like a little wrinkled paper, and then I run it forward on the self-gravity. What now happens is it then starts to fold into itself and start getting caustics, and you start getting these features of the large scale structure. But now, since we have a piecewise linear approximation to the distribution function, instead of just having polygons, we actually have volume filling information, which we can use to reconstruct the density field in some approximation everywhere in space. These are just the corresponding particle locations, and I think the difference is quite obvious. Just uh, to look in more detail, uh, this is the same simulation data. Uh, here using, you're using this tetrahedron in three-dimensional space, and this is using an uh, adaptive kernel filter approach. And so you see in these regions of, of strong anisotropic compression, you would have to exaggerate really the, the amount of softening in order to, to beat down uh, this, this, this beats on a string effect while at the same time you don't want to blur out more the, the isotropic wave collapse. The other feature is once you run this on CDM, you see that uh, this is again the same simulation data for a CDM simulation, that here, well, you have your filaments and so on, but actually there is much more going on in these simulations. Because you have perturbations on all scales, you get filaments on all scales. And all the structure is just lost completely in the short lines here. So this is great to analyze. We actually get now access to the fine grain distribution functions, density, velocity dispersion, some kind of entropy estimates. You can compute velocity distribution functions point wise. You see here signs of non thermal and so on. You can compute velocity fields everywhere in space without having to divide by the density. So this is the density, this is the velocity divergence, this is the velocity of the field. So you see velocity only emerges as it should be after shuttle crossing. And uh, so, uh, without any of this, this, this shock noise problems. Let's skip this one. So, the, the, the next interesting question is, of course, so this looks very promising to, to, to use this as an estimator for properties of simulations, but can we turn it into an algorithm? Because after all, we have the distribution function, we can use this now as a density estimator that we use in, in a Poisson equation, which then gives us the forces. So, oh, I, forgot, I forgot one slide. So, sorry, this is a mess. I don't really don't do this. Okay, so the idea is now we want to go back to a particle based method. So instead of having true tetrahedra, uh, we now discretize the tetrahedra again by particle. But now we have two kinds of particles. We have particles that represent the mass distribution of a tetrahedra, and we have particles that trace the flow and are massless. And they, all they do is just they span the tetrahedra. And then you can approximate um, the, the, the mass distribution of tetrahedra at, at, at monopole order by just putting it in the, in the center of mass, or at quadrupole order by putting four particles in. And you can compute this, so you can probably do it arbitrarily. Okay, so if you do this, uh, we, can, we can look at the behavior in, in a few test problem cases now, uh, where we know that the standard methods behave badly. So all we do here is having a, a particle mesh, which we use to compute the forces. And this is a plane wave perturbation at shell crossing, so when the singularity appears for the first time. And what you see is uh, for the, for, so you still have an analytic solution, which is given kind of here, this is the error with respect to the analytic solution. For the standard PM, as you go up in false resolution, you start to see that particles start seeing each other and they scatter off each other. And uh, this behavior is, is, is absent in the, in, if, if we use this, this, this new discretization of the distribution function, so actually if we increase the force resolution at the same mass resolution, we get a reduction in error. This is at shallow crossing, this is before shallow crossing, while the, the standard PM kind of does, does not really converge. At much later times, this conversion penalty is much more obvious. Uh, so you see here is the standard PM method. This is the monopole approximation, this is the quadrupole approximation. Uh, we keep the mass resolution the same. And I'll go up in, in false resolution on the PM mesh. And so while here it looks good, what you see is that all of a sudden uh, particle stars scattering all around in, in, in fair space. While in, well, it, yeah, but although you, typically if you use a tree, you would, you would have, would probably be closer to this. It, 
it's well, no, it's not because it's it's standard PM but in the low in low mass high force resolution. Level. Yeah. Okay. Uh, while while here you, you you don't see such a behavior, but you you don't scatter. Okay, but maybe this is a it's a, it's a Let's do a harder test. Now we look at a plane wave which is not uh, aligned with, with any symmetries of the, of the system. So it's just a, 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 an incommensurable mode going diagonally through the box. And so any kind of deviation will, will, will blow up probably, right? And so what we see here is, is yeah, so some of this noise is just due to the lack of symmetry, uh, but then uh, it just perturbs away. While here we also get some errors due to the lack of symmetry, but it, it kind of stays much better bounded on the, on the solution that we should expect. Let's look at a few two, 2D uh, test cases. So this is a phased uh, cold wave uh, in one dimension and in the other. So it, it first does a plane wave collapse and then should uh, form a, a clumpy structure in the, in the second dimension. Um, this is all at the same time. And this is just at the, t at the point when the, the, the second dimension shell process for the first time. Uh, we look in here at the standard PM. This is the monopole approximation for the, for the sheet discretization. And so you see that, that yeah, you, you, as you crank up the force resolution, you have noise that, that grows, grows and, and destroys the, uh, the structure. While, while here we, we, we kind of nicely and smoothly converge. This is a standard method, but in the, in the uh, low, low force resolution. And much later times after this has uh, this has uh, kind of starts to, to mix them. What we so it's again the same, cranking up the force resolution for the standard PM method. You see the noise just keeps growing and the structure starts to scatter each other. Yeah. And uh, while while no such paper, this is a, the focus. This was a reference solution, and then this is the 64 Q particles, 128 Q force resolution, standard PM. So we can we can finally run a cosmological problem. Uh, now we run a 300 uh, electron volt uh, warm dark matter spectrum, but in the with a distribution function in the cold limit, which is probably totally fine. Uh, so this is for the standard PM. As you crank up the, the force resolution, now you should get far sharper features, right? So we are non-adaptive, but we should get sharper features. But what we get instead is again these beats on the string that, that people have always been seeing. Uh, just everywhere you start seeing this. While at the, at the monopole, uh, we see that these features now become sharper as they should become. Uh, sorry, these are maximum intensity projections of the gravitational force. Uh, and at quadrupole, um, it's the same thing. So features do become sharper as they should, as we increase the force resolution, and they shouldn't produce uh, all the sudden straight errors. So looks like this completely cures this artificial fragmentation. But there is a problem, of course. Um, we shouldn't keep it under the rug. The problem is mixing. So the problem is, uh, think of, of a, of a non, uh, blob uh, orbiting in a non-harmonic potential. So this is position velocity. What will happen is that this will phase mix and spread out uh, basically space filling between, between the, the you know, boundary and the outer boundary. So if we put a line element in it, this will just stretch and it will stretch. And if we don't insert new points, now we'll deposit the mass along this, which does not correspond to the time average of the distribution function. And so this introduces a mass bias if we don't uh, refine. And so we've, we've been working now on, on inserting, because you, uh, inserting new vertices. As you start to deviate here, you just insert a new vertex. You can, you can measure the error. And uh, it kind of works, but uh, it's... Uh, it's still too early to show any results, so hopefully next time we'll have something for this. And so uh, in phase mixing, chaotic mixing situations, the sheet surface grows much more rapidly than you can track with, uh, with the Lagrangian motion of your, of your vertices, and so uh, probably grows exponentially fast. And so there is a clear limit to, to actually keep tracking the microscopic distribution function. And so in, in that limit, either you have to resort to, to a statistical sampling again, Probably now you're in a fine situation to do that, 
or you keep refining and look if you still see differences. Okay, so this is work in progress. Let me just uh, show the last uh, slides. The application of this is, of course, now uh, maybe we lose when we when we uh, go in the in the strong uh, in, in the strong mixing situations, but uh, maybe for the first time we can measure the the mass function of one dark matter of halos in the absence of being dominated by by unphysical artificial fragments. And all of a sudden, it's actually it's super interesting the standard halo fineness start to fail because the filaments do not fragment anymore, but now have anisotropic, very dense cores. So, so uh, an isodensity going to a halo fiber like Friends of Friends now finds these kind of connected up dense structures. And so we have to work a little bit of this. But then uh, what, we, what we got is, 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 is a, I think, a rather neat result. So this is just a standard uh, tree PM result um, where you see small structures everywhere. This is a PM in a low uh, resolution setting, low force resolution setting. This is the new method, and you see that all this, this small scale stuff is gone. As we see here, this is this bump from, from fragmentation, and, and you get a complete suppression of this. And if you look at, um, because you would expect that the mass function has a sharp truncation and small masses because you have a sharp feature, um, this is actually more subtle than this. Uh, if, you, if you look at, uh, it's my last slide. Uh, if, if you look at what happens as, at, uh, at the halos as you cross uh, over this, uh, this mass scale is that they are very, very different structures. So they are dense and they kind of start to virilize as you cross across the scale. And so the, the, uh, the, the halos below the truncation scale in the initial spectrum are, are structures that are really collapsing for the first time monolithically at that time. And then start to virilize very quickly, but by the time they're virilized, they're already across this mass scale. Once you filter those out, you get a very sharp uh, truncation in the mass function. And so you get a mass function that has uh, suppression on, on, on the high mass and, and the low mass. And if you look at the time evolution of this, actually, you see that this scale is, is basically not evolving in time. Okay, so let me just uh, put up my summary.